We're back now benchmarking Cyberpunk 2077 on a number of different CPUs, following up our GPU benchmarks. And with Cyberpunk specifically, there's some extra fun for benchmarking because it's just buggy enough that your character might randomly T-pose pantsless, or you might find floating newspaper that you can jump on. But either way, we're gonna be looking at the numbers today for the benchmarks, including 1080p at low, medium, high, 1440 at medium, and think there's high in there as well. And we'll be looking at critically frame times for some key CPUs. Before that, this video is brought to you by Crucial Ballistics Memory, including the new kits targeted for use with AMD's new Ryzen 5000 CPUs. Crucial's new Ballistics Max Memory is some of the highest performing memory on the market and can be tuned for timings and clocks to improve performance. The company also has its other Crucial Ballistics kits for a more affordable entry to enthusiast-grade memory. Crucial is a Micron brand and has direct access to its own memory supply. Learn more at the link in the description below. So for these benchmarks today, other than having to scrub all the footage we've captured to make sure there's nothing that'll get us banned from YouTube because we're not quite sure if Cyberpunk's various filters in the settings work properly, uh, we'll also be looking at, again, frame times. That's the number one thing to look at here for a couple of the CPUs, specifically the Ryzen 3 3300X. It's a four core, eight thread part, but there are some limitations with its performance behaviors. And in these charts, a key thing to keep in mind that we want to point out early for anyone who's new here. There's a couple of bars. So there's average FPS, 1% low, and 0.1% low. 1% low and 0.1% low help us to root out CPUs that might have undesirable behavior, like sudden spikes. People describe these as stutters, hitches, lag. Uh, you might perceive it as a loop in animation that has already completed and has repeated. So that's what 1% and 0.1% helps us discover in data if we haven't observed it on screen. But what really we need to do once we have some uncharacteristically low lows is to then create a frame time plot where you can see frame by frame how many milliseconds it takes to draw each one and you'll see the spikes. So that's the recap for anyone new here. And the 3300X and the 8600K are the ones we want you to pay attention for those charts because some CPUs will look pretty good in just the benchmark bar graphs. But you have to remember that these are sort of glimpses in time. They're averages of averages, which makes them accurate. But it also means that you can lose some of the data integrity of those really key large spikes that might not be numerous, but are potentially experience ruining when they happen. So we'll be looking at a lot of that today. Uh, not every CPU will be on here. Obviously, the, this be becomes uh, exceptionally time consuming with Intel because they require a new platform for basically every generation. So you're changing the whole platform out for a benchmark. So we won't have everything, but you can use some basic reasoning abilities to determine roughly where a CPU will fall based on the numbers we're giving you. And the best way to do that is determine an average percent scale from something that is on these charts to your CPU in uh, previous reviews. So you can look up some old benchmarks of the CPUs that you might have and compare them to the modern ones, take the average percent improvement and then apply it here. It's not perfect. And in some cases it's a little bit off, but it'll get you a rough idea of where you might fall. Our objective, as we discussed in the GPU benchmarks, is the same. So we're trying to determine the average performance for Cyberpunk 2077. To do this in our GPU benchmark suite for Cyberpunk, we took the first 30, 45 minutes or so of gameplay captured for frame rate logging and frame time logging. And then we looked at where's the middle. And we took that and that's our benchmark course. There are places that are worse, that are harder for the hardware to handle, and there are places that are easier. So we took something that's right about in the middle and that's fairly representative of play overall, but keep in mind that there's going to be times when the, uh, the game is more abusive on the hardware than the average that we've chosen. And there's times that'll be easier on the hardware. For the GPU, we're using the 3080 FTW3. Our benchmarking methodology is similar to our CPU methodology in general, except the game has changed. The test area is the same as the GPU test area though for this game. And uh, the memory, we're using heavily tuned memory. It actually performs better than say 3600 CL16 or something. Uh, what we're, we're running does in fact perform better on these CPUs and we've proven that in past content. As for the GPU, for people asking, well, why are you using a 3080 with all of these, like a 3300X? Surely that's an unrealistic combination. It's because we want to produce numbers that show the scaling of the CPU alone and isolate that as a variable. Pretty basic stuff, again, for a core audience, but we are going to reach more people with this, so it's worth repeating that point. Now, that said, we will have some GPU-bound benchmarks, so we're going to have 1080p high and 1440 with higher settings 
and that starts to impose a GPU constraint on the CPUs. So you can see where the scaling stops and where the GPU starts to matter more than the CPUs might. And finally, one last point here. The game is, in fact, very buggy, as you've likely seen at this point. And so the behavior may be different for different combinations of software and hardware. Uh, we controlled this in a, it's a highly controlled test environment. It's like for like. We're taking control of things like time of day. Uh, we're using the exact same save file, the same location. We're benchmarking a, a very specific way that's repeatable, and it's all heavily controlled. So the numbers within this data are comparable to each other, but that doesn't mean that you can compare the numbers across to other tests, especially those that might benchmark a, a lighter load scenario or a heavier load scenario, or just the, the fact that the hardware sometimes behaves oddly with this game right now as it's getting ironed out. OK, let's get into the benchmarks. This chart is among the three most populous and is for 1080p low testing. The objective here is to establish a truly unconstrained scaling benchmark for CPUs when unlimited by the GPU, but our 1080p medium benchmarks will help show how it compacts at the higher settings. Here, the 5900X ran the fastest of all the CPUs that we tested so far, capping at 172 FPS average and with lows that scaled proportionally well. 119 FPS for 1% 1 and 106 FPS for 0.1% leave little indication of any sudden stutters. But those did occur elsewhere, and we've got an asterisk next to a few items on this chart for some special discussions we need to have about the frame time pacing. The 5900X outpaces the 5600X by 14% in average, which is more substantial than we typically expect. This starts a trend of cores seemingly providing some value beyond just the clock differences in these SKUs. To further illustrate that point, take a look at the R5 2600 and R7 2700. The 2700 runs 10% higher average FPS than the 2600, and with the 3700X compared to the R5 3600, we also see scaling similar of 131 FPS average versus 112 FPS average, or 17% lead over the 3600. In most other game benchmarks that we've used in our CPU suite in the past, the R5 3600 and R7 3700X often land within a few percentage points of each other. It's rare that games actually leverage those extra threads, but it seems to be happening here. Back to the top, the 10900K falls into second place. It's new position since Ryzen 5000 CPUs launched, and the 10600K runs third without an OC. The R5 5600X sits roughly tied with the 10600K, and lows between these two are not noticeably different to a human. The i7-9700K is the first to show a sudden drop in 0.1% low performance and is an indicator of frame-to-frame -frame interval spikes throwing off the average in a way that requires further inspection. Let's break and take a look at that chart. In case you're new here, this plot shows the frame-to-frame -frame interval measured in milliseconds, which is the most empirical way to look at actual gameplay performance in a live gaming scenario. This shows the period of time required to present each frame to the player. Lower is better, but more consistent is best and we ideally see excursions from frame n-1 lower than 8 to 12 milliseconds. Overall, the 9700K plots around 8 millisecond frame times, which is good. We see some initial spikes to 15 milliseconds, but that's still not much of a problem. The real problem emerges around frame 2700 and frame 3000, where we see large spikes to 34 to 35 milliseconds a few times in succession. Once or twice isn't a big deal. But the problem is that if this happens consistently, say every couple minutes, it becomes more noticeable and it gets worse in more intensive scenarios. Controlling for CPU intensive settings would help lessen the impact of this behavior, but uh, overall you still might encounter it when in higher load scenarios like heavy combat. It's not experience ruining on this CPU, but it is enough to be noticeable over a period of a few minutes. We'll return back to the bar graph now for 1080p low once again. The 3700X allows the 5600X to maintain a lead in spite of its core disadvantage, and that's thanks to the IPC increase and the frequency bump that the Ryzen 5000 series received. We saw this in the reviews as well, where it's only a few applications that the 3700X does better. This is compliant with previous CPU testing and all makes sense. The 9900K is able to better balance the frame time consistency as compared to the 9700K, but the average frame rate was unchanging for us, for the most part. The 8700K also maintains better frame time consistency than the 9700K, likely a benefit of the thread count, but it has a lower average FPS overall. Now we need to call attention to the i5-8600K and the R3-3300X. Both have asterisks, and that's because both looked fine in the benchmarks here, but we observed significant stutter and poor playback at times when getting to our testing location. 
This doesn't always show up in the usual bench passes, and sometimes that's by pure chance. Some of that depends on the game and how consistent it is on its own, and some of it just depends on what is in the bench pass. We ended up running a longer recording time and engaged in some combat, some driving, and traversal, and experienced plummets for frame times on both of these CPUs. Here's a frame time plot for the 8600K. In this one, we were experiencing that teleport style of gameplay, where you'd get a hard stutter and then a repeat of animation played back over the last couple of frames. It's the most classic instance of lag that everyone's familiar with, and it behaves like network lag in a way, except obviously it isn't from the network. We encountered one frame time that spikes to about 100 milliseconds, but several other major excursions from the mean spiking to 40 to 50 milliseconds. Towards the end of capture, you'll also see several clustered spikes towards 30 milliseconds. This becomes noticeable and jarring to the player, because it's a frame to 30 milliseconds, a frame to 12 milliseconds, then a frame again at 30 milliseconds, and so forth. The 8600K seems to be capable of playing this game with a good average frame rate, but it clearly suffers in times when the cores can't keep up with the workload. Here's where it gets bad. The 3300X, despite coming out of the benchmarks with a completely playable 96 FPS average and really impressive performance in the bar chart, it ends up struggling once we drill into the frame times. As always, averages only tell so much of the story. In this case, that part of the story looks good. Even averages of 1% and 0.1% numbers are limited in scope at times. The 3300X encounters numerous spikes within a three minute period to 40 milliseconds. Then we engaged in some driving and some combat, and we started running into routine 90 millisecond frame time spikes. This ruins an otherwise good experience, unfortunately, and begins to result in heavy stuttering and breaks in the animation. It's okay to encounter a repeat frame occasionally, but animation needs to be consistent from one frame to the next. Here, it wasn't. It would replay. And so you get that classic, again, network lag style of repeating movement and animation once the game unhitches itself. Here's a chart for 1080p medium. Everything drops proportionately for the most part. The 5900X lost 5.5% of its performance from 1080p low. The 10900K lost 6.6%. 10600K lost 3%. And all of these maintained the same hierarchy as before. The same asterisks apply to the 3300X and the 8600K as before as well. But in terms of performance, the 3300X dropped a few FPS in addition to its already spiky behaviors. This is interesting specifically because it means that even though we are already in a CPU bind at low settings, moving to medium settings has introduced additional CPU load. With a lot of games, increasing the settings primarily has an impact on GPU load. So it's rare that you'll see scaling when you're GPU bound if you're looking at CPU behaviors. Thus far, even at medium settings, there's still GPU scaling headroom afforded by the 3080 FTW3. That said, anything below the top four results could be run on a lower end GPU and would be bottlenecking on that GPU, not the other way around. So if you're running something below the top four, then you're not gonna get extra out of a 3080 than you would from say a 3070 or a 6800 or something like that. This next chart is the last fully filled chart we have, and then the next ones will be heavily truncated charts for higher settings. At 1440p medium, the scaling is cut heavily, and the top CPUs all end up functionally tied, or close to it. In a technical sense, now that we're GPU constrained, Intel CPUs are pulling ahead of AMDs. Not necessarily in a meaningful way, but in a way that's measurable and repeatable. We need to look into this further to fully understand this behavior and why it might be happening, or what the explanation would be for it specifically. As of now though, uh, even though we don't have an explanation, we can say with confidence that the behavior was repeatable in our test passes on multiple test platforms and with additional full retests. The 10600K and 10900K are tied and limited by the GPU. It seems our performance ceiling here is 125 FPS average. In the past, the gap between Intel and AMD would make sense when GPU bound because AMD historically would have its own slightly lower GPU ceiling than Intel would, when you are fully GPU constrained, at least with a 3000 series and prior. Regardless, the 5000 series CPU is capped at 120 FPS average here with the 3080 FTW3. The 9700K and 9900K were again tied. The 5600X and 5900X were mostly tied as well. And any difference in these smaller data ranges can be chalked up as a GPU bind and therefore invalid for CPU to CPU comparison. The good news is that after a certain point, your CPU choice won't matter that much for specifically this game with these settings. It might matter for other things you do, but beyond an 8700K or even an R5 3600, there's not a ton of room for scaling in the GPU heavy scenarios. 
CPUs like the i5-8600K and R3-3300X still remain problematic for their hard stutters that occur in some scenes. And that doesn't get better here. This chart would be useful for determining how much room you might have to upgrade if you intend to run a more GPU-constrained set of settings, which is likely for this game. At 1440p high, we only tested some AMD parts and then a 10900K because we're going to be GPU bound enough that the CPUs won't really matter as much. The 10900K leads at 101 FPS average with the 5600X and 5900X a couple percent behind. Now again, this isn't the stack up we would expect following the 5000 launch. Typically those would be leading the 10900K, but we were able to reproduce this result multiple times at least with our test area and method of testing. The 3300X is the only one that stands out as distant. And even here, the improvements of the 5900X reduced from 80% at 1080p low to 12% at 1440p high. And that's strictly looking at average FPS. That's because the 5900X's ceiling has been cut down by the GPU limitation. That doesn't mean that all these CPUs are the same, or even that 12% is a fair representation of their differences. Even though the supposed advantage from moving uh, to a 5900X from a 3300X is only 12% here, there's still meaningful uplift in frame time pacing, and the experience is significantly better on the 3600 and up. Finally, at 1080p high, it's the same as the previous chart. We've cut about half of the CPUs from the chart since they've become largely irrelevant to demonstrate this point, which is that a CPU limitation will make a lot of the parts look the same. There's still good room between an R5 3600 and the 5900X or 5600X here, but the range is crushed from the 1080p low results. In the least, though, it shows that your CPU maintains relevance up until at least 1080p high if using something similar to an RTX 3080. But the previous 1440 high results show that the CPUs get pushed closer together. The 3300X maintains its occasional frame time pacing issues, and those we discussed and showed earlier. So as expected then, the game is largely GPU bound. Sure, at 1080 low, you see scaling basically across the whole stack for what we tested. And the 5900X to 5600X gap is a meaningful one. It's not always that large of a difference between those two parts. So you can create large differences. Realistically, if you're using those higher end CPUs especially, you're probably gonna be looking more at a 1080 high type of workload, even if you have a higher target resolution. If you're running DLSS, it might be effectively a 1080 high type of workload, or maybe 1440, and the higher settings is more, it's closer to what you're planning to run. Regardless of what it is, we've got some numbers in here to show you that, obviously, as you increase the GPU load, the CPU matters less. However, there is a limit to uh, the, the amount that the importance diminishes of the CPU, even as the GPU load ramps, and that limit appears to be CPUs like a 3300X, like an 8600K, where we become core thread bound, uh, or your frequency and IPC are just not that strong in cases of some of the older parts, but certainly core and thread bound is something that we see popping up with an 8600K, for example. And so in those instances, it is uh, likely that you'll encounter some kind of, at least based on our experience anyway, you'll encounter some kind of experience marring behavior where there's a sudden spike in frame times and it represents itself as a stutter or as a hitch in gameplay that doesn't necessarily appear on the average charts. It kind of does. You can see a dip in the frame time, the 0.1% averages, just enough to know there's something there to investigate. It's really the frame time plots where they appear. And so the takeaway is that even if you're planning to run GPU bound, which is very likely with this game because it is so GPU constrained, you should still have a CPU of a certain base level of quality to support those GPUs. Even if the average scaling doesn't change that much, the consistency of frame pacing could potentially change a lot, going from, a again, a 3300X or an 8600K as two examples we benchmarked here today. So that's the takeaway. It seems as if an R5 3600, we did not in our experience running the game thus far encounter anything that was similar to the, the 3300X or 8600K behavior on the 3600. So certainly sound off on your experience. If you're running that CPU and you've been playing it, let people be below know what your experience was. Uh, keep in mind, however, that that may not apply blanket to everybody because there's so many combinations of hardware and software and the game's buggy as is. But we didn't encounter issues with the 3600 or up. So that seemed to be about the cutoff for where the really bad frame time behavior would happen in the test passes we were running and uh, 
perhaps it'll pop up elsewhere, but we haven't encountered it yet. So that seems to be about the baseline for quality. The 5000 series does excellently here. The 10 series does fine as well. It's about where you'd expect it to be. And that should get everyone up to speed on the CPU benchmarks. If you want to see how the GPUs perform, though, because this is mostly a GPU-bound game, then check out our GPU benchmark piece for Cyberpunk 2077 already live. And we have more coming yet. We've got a DLSS qualitative analysis coming up next that looks at the actual visual differences between it. We already looked at the benchmark differences in the GPU piece, but now it's time to look at the quality differences. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.